All right. We're good on the music. I'm going to transition a little bit. Just, I'm just going to move into something just for a few minutes. It's hot. I don't think you really care. We still have a lot of things going on for the day. And so I, I'm not going to... Uh, I'm not going to keep you long. We have baptisms that will follow this particular service. We do that every single Sunday. And so I know some of you are here for that. Normally, it's right here on the live stream. It's going to be out in the parking lot just in front of the overflow tent. And depending on uh, how many people are there, we'll determine whether I, I, I've done almost exclusively all of the baptisms that we've had uh, in the last three years. Sometimes we will have some other people that will help just because of the volume. I think last year during the conference, I baptized 265 people the first day. And uh, so it was a lot. It took a lot out of me. And so... Uh, get this, two weeks ago, look, I, I'm going to brag on Jesus because there's a book in the Bible called the book of Numbers, so it's okay to keep record because the Bible says in the book of Acts, we know how many people got saved. And so look, I'm not in a peeing contest with anybody, but I'll tell you one thing, two weeks ago, since COVID broke out, we baptized our 10,000th convert in this tent, 10,000 baptisms. So, so don't tell me that boldness and courage runs people off. It drives them in. They're excited about it. Amen. So we'll have some baptisms, and then let me just go ahead and give you a, a quick rundown for the day, okay? Normally, we do mass deliverance, which tonight will be mass. Uh, mass deliverance at 6 o'clock. Tonight, it will be at 7 o'clock because Apostle Alexander Pagani, who I, I think still down there stirring them up. Oh, okay, amen. Praise God. He's been out of our Hispanic folks. I mean, setting them on fire. Tonight, he's going to have an elongated time of teaching. He said, you know what? I don't want to come in this year just as a headlining preacher. I want to come in apostolically and teach on deliverance. Amen. So he's going to do that tonight. And so I don't want you to miss. That's going to be from about 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock. That will move us into the spirit of our mass deliverance. Now, at 3 o'clock, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the, the time up to him. He can do 3, 3.30, whatever. He does have a limited number of his brand new book that will come out next week, The Secrets of Generational Curses. So he will have that. He does have some other material. He wasn't able to fly a whole lot with him, and, uh, but he will be doing a bit of a meet and greet. So what we will do is, uh, since we're, we're kind of both re releasing the books and some people have, have not been through our line as of yet, at 3 o'clock, what we'll do is both of us will just be up here on the platform, all right? So uh, uh, Pagani and myself will both be up here. I'll have a table set up. I want you to and, and go to his, right? Especially if you've already got my book, shake his hand, get pictures with him. If you're only going to buy one book, buy his, not mine, all right? You can get mine later some other time. But uh, at 3 o'clock, he can do 3.30 if he wants to, up till 5. But at 3 o'clock, we'll be up here. We'll have two tables set up, and I'll be on one side. He'll be on the other, and that'll just keep a little bit of a better flow. And I know many of you want to meet Apostle Pagani. And so 3 o'clock, he'll be doing that. At 5 o'clock, he will be uh, teaching on delivery for a couple of hours, and then that will send us right into our mass deliverance time. Are you still glad you have come to the conference? Amen. Well, I'm glad you've come too. I, I need to uh, save as much of my voice for tonight as I possibly can, but I do have a little something on my heart that I want to share over the context of the next few moments, and this is a passage that all of us have heard many, many times when it comes to the deliverance discussion. But there are some things about this passage that I fear that we have missed and we have failed to navigate properly in an understanding of the text. And how many of you believe Bible preaching ought to really come out of the Bible? Amen? So I'm really not going to labor for a long time. I'm going to let the text say what the text needs to say. I really struggled with even the aspect of, of even just jumping in it. We've had so much worship. We've had so many testimonies. We've had so much God doing stuff. This, this conference is really not about me. You know, last time we kind of put it together, I had to preach a few times just because we didn't know everybody and didn't have enough speakers. But I, I'm glad this time, I could have just done mass deliverance and been happy. I'm just, I'm getting fed. This is feeding me, right? This is feeding me. But as the, the shepherd of this house, the father of this house, as God has allowed me to be in his sovereign grace, I, I just I want to impart something to you from Mark chapter number 5. So I want you to go there for a few moments. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to preach, teach, slash just talk a little bit. All right? I'm not going to overload my voice over the course of the next few moments. And so the guys... You, you don't have to worry about having me at Isaiah's volume, but you can still keep me up a little bit because I'm just going to I'm gonna chit-chat from my heart as a shepherd from a very familiar passage of Scripture. And here's what wrecks me 
about Mark chapter number 5. If you take all the spirits that we deal with in deliverance ministry, if you take all of the things that we call out, you know what's interesting? The top level things that we struggle with in deliverance ministry are all mentioned as plain as day right here in the context of what we call the maniac of Gadara. She mentioned him a moment ago in her own testimony in relation to this. And I'm amazed at how many times we've read through this passage and we've not seen the narrative that is not about salvation. It's strictly about a man that was delivered from demons. For years as an evangelist with my seven suits and seven sermons, I would blow in, blow up, and blow out, and I would talk about this glorious conversion experience of the maniac of Gadara when he repented and believed the gospel and God forevermore changed his life. Did God forevermore change his life? Absolutely, because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and a salvation that won't change you will not save you. That's a fact. But this passage is not about a man that repents and believes the gospel. When Jesus says, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee, he referred in the context to great things and compassion as deliverance ministry. It never says one thing about repentance or the gospel, although we understand the concepts are there. This is a passage that is nothing to do with salvation and everything to do with a man's deliverance from demons. And we've preached it for years. Look what happens when you get saved. Yes, you change when you get saved. But the text is, look what happens when the power of the name of Jesus drives demons out of your life. That's what this passage is about. And ironically enough, for a deliverance conference, it deals with some of the greatest strongholds and strong men's spirits in one passage in one man. So we've prayed plenty, so I'm going to jump right in. Look, please, chapter 5, Gospel of Mark, verse 1. And they, Jesus and the disciples, came over into the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. Let me stop and say this. As we peruse through the text, this is important. Jesus, in chapter 4, was in an unbelievable revival experience. He looks at his disciples and says, don't ask me any questions, just obey. Pack up your Bibles. And I want you to get in that rickety raft because we're going across the water. They didn't know why they were going across the water. And they didn't know what would happen when they got in the boat. And I'm glad God does not show me the future. My grandfather used to say, if I knew when and where I was going to die, I wouldn't get up and go there that day. But I can assure you, if you've got God with you in the boat, it does not matter if the devil sinks it to the bottom. He'll make a Holy Ghost submarine out of it. Jesus said, get in. We are going to the other side. He didn't say you're going to drown in the process. And if he said we're going, you better know, church, we're going. So they came unto the other side. And it's interesting that Jesus left multitudes to minister to one man. You see, if we're not careful, we'll become religious because religious groups focus on masses of people. Christianity focuses on individuals because you never reach the masses unless you do it one individual at a time. So Jesus leaves multitudes for one man. Watch this, verse 2. And when he was come out of the ship immediately, he didn't put up a tent. He didn't have a sign for a coffee shop and donuts. Nothing. Didn't have a book signing. Immediately, there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Now look at me and hear me when these words fall from my mouth. Jesus did not have to drag this man out of the tombs. He came looking for Jesus. And I'm telling you what I find in deliverance ministry and what these men and women of God will tell you is that people know when they're in bondage and they won't help. That's why they drive and fly for miles. That's, that's why people show up in South Carolina, Henry Schaefer's church. I, I'll never forget the first time he ever told me about deliverance. I thought, there is no way this is an accident this guy's talking to me about this. I'll let him tell you more tomorrow when he teaches, but he told me the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go in and take out the front row of your church. 
because I'm going to fill it with wheelchairs. And people are going to get out of them. And I heard him saying that, and I'm like, what? See, see, see still back in that day, I was just transitioning. I'm like, that sounded like some Benny Hinn stuff right there. <laughs> oh, yes. And people driving all, oh, he don't pastor a mega church, but he's got a mega heart. And people, by the thousands, reach out to this man of God for personal, private deliverance. Why? Because there's something inside of them, not just an evil spirit, but something in their own heart that says, I know there's something wrong, and I know there's torment, and I don't have to have these nightmares, and my marriage doesn't have to be falling apart. I don't have to be addicted. I need help. And this man came out of the tombs to find Jesus himself. But here's where things get interesting. It says in verse number three, who had his dwelling among the tombs. That's the second time in two verses it mentions the tombs. I'm going to tell you why. Because one of the biggest things we meet in deliverance ministry is the spirit of death. And here it is right here in this context. A spirit of darkness. A spirit that draws people to torment, murder, death, Darkness, nightmare. It's right here in the text. Twice. Matter of fact, it's going to be mentioned several times. Here's a man that lives in the graveyards. Now, look, if you've got best friends that live in tombs and graveyards, you need some new best friends. This guy lived in a shadow of death. Why? Because there was a spirit of darkness. There was a tormenting spirit of death in that legion that drew him to it. Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. Let me tell you something. Stop celebrating death in your house and stop, start celebrating life in your house. So here's a man that's messing around in the tombs. He's in the graveyards. He finds Jesus. He comes out. And the Bible says that here is this man with this unclean spirit, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. They tried to bind him. He'd been in that Saturday night drunk tank, incarcerated a few times. He'd bend the bars like a superman. He'd bust the shackles, as we'll see in just a moment. He'd go running out into the highways and byways, screaming, hollering, yelling, going crazy. A man buck wild full of the devil. A man that no doubt had opened himself up to some occultic involvement at some time in his life. And now he's tormented every single day. The Bible says always night and day. Not sometimes, half the time. No, no, it says always. All means all. And that's all all will ever mean in the Bible. So here's this man with this spirit of death, his dwelling amongst the tombs. No man could bind him. How many of you know that sometimes you can see an eight-year-old kid flirt with a demon and they'll levitate plumb off the floor if five security guards don't hold him down. They can throw chairs, pick up cars. They get strong quick. It's almost like they ate some spinach and Popeye comes out. And you got to be older than 40 to know anything that just came out of my mouth. Amen. <laughs> Kids are like, what's Popeye? Yes. <laughs> and so this guy had this supernatural strength about him that just began to well up on the inside. And we see that so often in deliverance ministry, a supernatural strength. You know why people cannot explain in the natural what they're dealing with? Because they're not dealing with the natural. They're dealing with supernatural. And there's a supernatural element that gives people power. By the way, let me just say something. You have never met... A satanic cessationist. You ain't never met a witch that says, well, I believe all the gifts have ceased. You ain't never met a sorcerer, a wizard, a warlock, some Harry Potter wannabe. You have never met a full-blown individual in witchcraft that says, well, you know, I just believe all the power of the demonic has ceased. The power of spirits have ceased. I just believe that all the gifts have ceased. Do you know why they're in that nonsense? Because there's power in the new age. People get mad at me when I call out yoga. There's better ways to stretch, ma'am. It means yoked to a spirit. They call the instructors yogis. Derek Prince has a whole teaching on that so you can get mad at him because he's dead. Don't get mad at me while I'm alive. 
people burning sage because somebody on Facebook said, oh, if you burn sage in your kitchen, it'll keep demons away. You are crazy. You burn sage in your kitchen, you'll be cooking sausage with demons is what you'll be doing. They'll be rolling up in your house. I say things in mass deliverance about dream catchers and people are, oh my goodness, we cannot believe that you said something about dream catchers. I can't believe you don't go to Books A Million and figure out what section you have to buy them in. You can't buy a dream catcher without a Ouija board being right beside it, tarot cards being right beside it, healing crystals being right beside it, and then people want to get mad at a deliverance ministry because I say, that's why you have nightmares in your house. Because you've got dream catchers hanging from your windshield. We, we've had ladies walk up. I need deliverance. I don't know what's wrong. Dream catcher earrings. Take them out. Boo! Just happens. I'm just telling you. It's amazing the things that we justify in our lives. But do you know why people get involved in that stuff? There's power in it. So here's what we've... Basically, in essence, here's what I taught for 30 years. The devil has power. God had power. But he gave it up. So the devil could have all the fun. Huh? Help me, Holy Ghost. Don't die me now. I'll keep you here till book signing at 3 o'clock. People get involved in the new age because there's power in it. When Moses threw his stick down... It became a serpent. When the witch doctors of Egypt threw their sticks down, they became serpents. The devil has power, but greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And if God be for us, who can be against us? I'm not worried about what some witch says, what some warlock says. I'm here to tell you there is power, power, wonder working power in the name and through the blood of Jesus Christ this morning. There is power in Jesus' name. We get these witches all the time. We're going to hex you. We're going to vex you. That's all right. We're going to break it off. I was telling somebody yesterday, I'm just going to chit-chat for a minute. We get the craziest things that come against us at this tent. You think we're just a redneck tent church. We're not a threat to anybody. Why in the world so many people got to hate us? We get more witches show up at this house. We get witches that show up at deliverance conference. Don't start looking around. They in here. They in here. There's like whole Facebook shows, whole Facebook pages where these people, they, they won't show their face, but they got these cauldrons and they're casting Greg Locke spells. Get a little chicken wings in there. I'm like, I am washed in the blood. You think your little B-dubs, Wingstop witchcraft gonna keep me from preaching the gospel? So we had one of them a while back. Our people know I ain't got name names, but I'm known for it. So don't move wrong. We had one that's coming here for a while. Sometimes I have compassion on them. I feel bad for them. I'm trying to reach them. We love witches too. We just don't love witchcraft. So we had one of them coming for a while, and every time she would show up, there was just this weird aura, aroma. You can just smell witchcraft. It was weird. She's always down here at the front, like doing some muju on my pulpit. She'd like lay stuff there, security come over and pick it up, and take it back to her. Oh, you dropped something. Oh, I'm so sorry. And then every week she'd just like be like bracelets up here, Bibles up here. She, she'd just, she'd just be like hexing stuff, right? Just like leave it on the platform. And I, I was tired of it. She showed up at the Firefall Conference. She showed up at the Deliverance Conference. Everything we do, she just up in here. And so... I told our security one night, she showed up for the first time ever about, I don't know, a month ago, a month and a half ago. She showed up at a mass deliverance service, and I was like, oh, man, this is going to be crazy. Maybe she's here to get some help. Oh, no, she wasn't here to get no help. She come right down. I was doing the renunciation, and she's standing down there. Oh, it wasn't no, no praying in tongues. It was some graveyard chanting or something. And I'm surprised she didn't, you know, have like a pentagram popping out of her head and burning candles and had a hula hoop going around. I don't know. She was crazy mess. And I said, all right. I said, stop right now. I'm right in front of everybody. You ask them. 
I said, stop right now. I said, we got a witch in this house, and she's trying to witch everything we're trying to do. And I didn't even call her out. I didn't even say her name. I didn't even look her away. But she knew who I was. I talked about. So she stopped, and she's like started walking around. She started going around the back of the tent. I said, security, go get her right now. Get her, get her out of the tent. Get her out of the tent. Get her out of the tent. <laughs> Listen, we'd already been in deliverance for 35, 40 minutes. What nothing happened. She walked through it. Help me, Holy Ghost. Kill me right now if I'm lying. They were there. She walked out that door. The second her foot walked through that door, bam, demons started flaring up all over this place. She was hindering the spirit because she was in connection to them evil spirits. So get this. You would think after doing that and then citing her for trespassing and telling her and her husband they're going to get arrested if they come back, you'd think they'd stay away. Oh, no. They show up five minutes before Wednesday night. We demand an audience with Pastor Locke. I'm getting ready to preach. You can demand all you want to. I ain't coming off the wall to talk to Harry Potter. <laughs> Wiggle your little nose and do your little astral projection business, right? So get this. This is the only church in America that what I'm about to tell you could happen in. This is so funny, it's stupid. <laughs> you know what she did the next week? She got to, we had to watch the security cameras to even prove it was, it was viable. She, she probably got like a happy mask on right now. She's hiding up in this room right now. She, she's here somewhere, probably. She got to church at 7 o'clock on a regular Sunday, right? We saw her on the security camera. She's up here. She's, she's doing something to my towel. And she's up here mood you in the pulpit. I mean, security camera. Ain't no lights on, nothing. She's up in here in a tent. Now, get this. This is crazy. <laughs> she is sweeping the whole platform on the security cameras at 7 o'clock in the morning after we done kicked her out and cited her for trespassing. And I said, help me, Holy Spirit. Now, you know, church in America that has a real witch with a real broom on the stage. <laughs> and your little dog, too. Ain't a church in America got full-blown witches with brooms showing up at ours. Look, you laugh, but here's the facts. I ain't never dressed up like a witch and went to one of their services. So why they dress up like Christians and try to come to ours, I will never figure out. But you know what they're intrigued by? Power. So stop all this nonsense that the devil's got all the power, gets to have all the fun, and God's people get to sit around in the doldrums like their mother-in-law moved in. You don't ask your wife for permission to laugh at that joke. You can <laughs> but keep reading <laughs> because verse 4 he'd often been bound with fetters and chains the chains were plucked I like that just like a psh, dental floss plucked asunder by him you ever had handcuffs on you ain't plucking them hmm I ask you ever had handcuffs on everybody gets all quiet starts staring at the floor half his crowd in this room been arrested in the back seat of a police car sometime you crazy <laughs> he plucked them the fetters were broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Shout tame. What that word means is the same idea of a zookeeper trying to tame it. And I'm going to tell you what the American church has done. The American church has learned to tame people's demons. Oh, just baptize them, let them walk an aisle, sign a card, pray a prayer, put them in a small group, make them a Sunday school teacher. The average pastor in the American landscape has so little discernment, they put full-blown witches over the prayer ministry these days. She walking around with a spirit of divination, and y'all praising her for having a voice of the prophetic. And we've done just enough to tame demons in our churches. Let them sing, let them worship, raise our hands, build us some nice buildings, get in one hour, get out. We got to beat the Methodists and Piscolopians to the Chinese buffet. We can't go longer than we're supposed to. God forbid anybody gets saved, healing breaks out, demons start screaming on the live stream. Oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? I know some pastors are like, well, I would never let what happens here happen at our church. And you'll never break 30 on Easter either. Because people are sick of religion. People are tired of us trying to stifle the work of the Holy Spirit of God. And by the way, God's sick of it too. 
And here in this context, the Bible says that they tried to tame him. And we have tried, listen to me, and I, I love you enough as your friend and a shepherd to say this. And I, and I know these men and women of God will agree with what I'm about to say. We have tried to use medicinal help and counseling services to get rid of demons. Look, if it's not a demon, get some medication. If it's not a demon, lay on a couch and talk to a therapist. If it's not a demon, get some treatment, get some traction, get some radiation, go to a prayer meeting. That's fine. If it's a demon, medication ain't going to get it out. Counseling's not going to get it out. Reading a book's not going to get it out. You can only drive it out through the power of the name of Jesus. There's only one remedy for a demon, and that's deliverance. Only one. Stop trying to tame people's demons. I, I, I pray this often. I'll probably end up praying it before the conference is done. But I, I pray this often over pastors because they come. They're like, man, you know, I want to. I kind of want to take deliverance to my church. And you know, the movies like Christian Contraband. You know, and so I didn't go to the movies, but now I can watch it at home in my pajamas and take notes. I'm like, yeah, you gonna get it. Your wife about to scream in the middle of the night. You about to get it. So they 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 show up here and they're like. What can I do to convince the people of my church that this is a reality? And I'm like, oh, I got the remedy for that. Come here. I'll lay hands on him and, I, and I'll just start praying. I won't even ask him. I'll say, Holy Spirit, when this man of God gets in the pulpit this Sunday, I pray one of his best people in church will manifest a full-blown demon right in the middle of his message. Make the pianist scream wide slam open, Lord. Let one of them deacons fall down and trip over his pack of cigarettes when he's walking in the back door. And it's crazy how many preachers call me on Monday. They're like, Pastor Locke, you're not going to believe what happened. I'm like, oh, I believe what happened. <laughs> Let old prim and proper sister wiggle jaw manifest three demons on Sunday morning during the offering. And you won't have to get up and preach at a deliverance conference. They will know that there's power in the name of Jesus when they see it with their very eyes. You can't put it back in the box once it comes out. You can't. I got to calm down. Y'all get me so cranked up. I feel like John Hagee when y'all do all that clapping business. <laughs> Woo. Man. Y'all could make a bad preacher feel good about himself. I could put a guy up here that lays an egg every Sunday and y'all would shout him down for the glory of God. Get a workout in this place. I don't even need to ride my mountain bike this afternoon. I feel like I done rode 12 miles up in here with y'all. I feel like I'm sweating. Y'all watch. Encore, encore. I'm like, y'all crazy. I ain't never met such crazy people at all my ministry. Really, y'all crazy. All you people outside, y'all crazy out there. All them people in that overflow tent, y'all turn around and wave at Larry. He's watching us. Hey, Larry. <laughs> so quit trying to tame demons. Am I making sense? I'm just talking a little bit. Verse 5. And always, say always. always. And then he's going to qualify what always means, night and day. Just in case you're wondering. That always. Well, he just meant, no, 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 always, night and day. He was in the mountains and in the tombs. Now, let me say this. We can focus on the spirit of death. I get it. But don't miss why he was also in the mountains. Because one of the biggest things that some of you have struggled with your whole life and some of you right now is a spirit of isolation. I'm not talking about alone time with God. I'm talking about a spirit of isolation that keeps you from fellowship because it is not good that a man should be alone. And I'm going to tell you what a spirit will do. A spirit of isolation will remove people from your life so the isolation can then become manipulation because the enemy can manipulate you when he gets your mind all to himself. Am I making sense in this tent? So we put him up there in the mountains and in the tombs crying. 
I've always been intrigued by that word. Matter of fact, it's circled in black right here in my Bible. Crying. Because the Bible does not contextually tell me what he's crying about. But I think I know. He's crying for relief. He's crying out for help. He's crying out for relief. He doesn't even know to call it deliverance, but he knows he needs it. And every day, like a wild coyote on the backside of the desert, he's weeping and wailing and crying out, grief pouring out of him. And everybody down below had already tried to tame him, given up on him. No help, no hope. This guy's nothing but a failure, speaking him word curses over him. And here he is in the mountains and in the tombs, weeping, 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 crying, 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 wanting help, but nobody there to help. But I do find this interesting. Do you know what's happening the exact moment this context is playing out? If you were to rewind, you would find out in this exact moment, Jesus is on a boat in a storm. Jesus is on a boat in a storm coming across the lake. And this man crying, weeping, wailing, cutting himself. No help, no hope. No help, no hope. No help, no hope. But I'm going to tell you something. When hope's all gone, help's on the way. And the moment this guy had given up all hope and he's crying out, Jesus said, hey, boys, get in that rickety raft. We're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. He's crying. Oh, so much could be said about that. And now watch this. And cutting himself with stones. Miss Jenny talked about that a moment ago. I'm going to tell you something right now. That is a spirit that is affecting this generation like never before. Cutting is an epidemic. You see, here's what our problem is. We read things in the Bible. And we so spiritualize it that we don't make the application of what's happening all around us. We're like, well, you know, here's this naked, crazy man. Looks like he stuck his finger in a 110 wall outlet. He's cutting himself. He's got a spirit of isolation. He's living in the tombs. Got a spirit of death and darkness. And oh, you know, we, we, just, we just don't meet people like that. You've lost your mind. You know what Mark chapter 5 is about? It's about a 16-year-old girl sitting behind her bedroom door right now with all of her lights out. And she's cutting her arms because daddy abandoned her. And she's got a spirit of rejection. And she doesn't know what to do because the only thing her boyfriend wants to do is sleep with her. And you don't love me if you don't do that. And all of a sudden, her life has compounded interest of demonic torment. And we're like, we don't ever see anybody like Mark chapter 5. Our churches are full of Mark chapter 5. broke down, beat up teenagers right now sitting behind the door of their house with a spirit of suicide. And all this social media generation hadn't helped. And by the way, help me, Holy Ghost, I'm going to say something because this is our church. I used to preach against, uh, and I'm, I'm going to be careful, but I'm going to be cool with it. I used to preach against all these teenagers being bullies on the internet. Then I got in the ministry. Started finding out some of these internet people are bullies. Some of these bully preachers using their pulpits as a bully. Beating people. To, I'm sick of it. No wonder there's no body, no unity in the body of Christ. The Church of Jesus Christ got more drama than a middle school dance right now in America. And I'm telling you, we have got to get back to a place where that spirit of division is something that we walk in a room and we destroy by the power and authority of the name of Jesus. So anyhow, I just want to add that in. But as we circle the wagons and come back, it's a beautiful picture, but a very vivid picture of people that you meet all the time. You just don't see people the way Jesus wants you to see them. We don't look into the eyes of people and see the struggle of their soul. And here's a man that represents so many people, perhaps even in this room, isolation, death, suicide, hurt, cutting yourself, starving yourself, gorging yourself. Doing something to appease that torment on the inside. See, it's everywhere. We just refuse to see it because it makes us uncomfortable, and it should. We're not talking about dandelions and butterflies. We're talking about demons. It should make us uncomfortable. But we continue. He's cutting himself with stones. And he saw Jesus afar off. I like that. Nobody had to say, hey, Jesus here. Oh, he knew he was there. You better know when authority walks in a room, demons know it. And you better also know demons will respond to the authority God's given you 
but they are not impressed by the arrogance that you've given yourself. Demons don't respond to arrogance. They respond to authority. And there is a difference. Say amen in this house. There is a difference. And demons know it. And we need enough spiritual discernment to know it and call that nonsense out as well. And so the Bible says that he runs to Jesus. Now watch this. He falls down before him and worshipped him. Now for everybody that's teeter-tottering on the fence, let's go ahead and just burn your fence down. It doesn't say that the demon ran and worshipped Jesus. It says the man that was full of demons ran and worshipped Jesus. And don't you tell me that believers can't be affected by evil tormenting spirits because our churches are full of people that raise their hands, wave flags, pray in tongues, dance in the aisle, shout when somebody preaches. They come to church to worship him, but they're full of demons. He's talking about the man came and worshiped Jesus. Well, you know, you just... You, you can't have people that go to church and get filled with the Holy Spirit and still struggle with demons. That's a demon telling you that. The Bible says this man full of demons came and worshiped Jesus. He knew the truth. Listen, if you put truth and fallacy side by side, the fallacy will always pale in comparison to the truth. You'll know it immediately. You'll know it immediately. And the Bible says that he came and he began to worship him. Watch this, verse 7, he cried with a loud voice. Five times it says that, so don't get nervous when people scream. It ain't them. They cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? Thou son of the most high God. It's amazing to me that demons will admit who Jesus is and woke preachers in this nation won't. I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Now, I'm just giving you the cliff notes. This is a 55,000 foot flyover message. We could drill down to this and preach for three hours, but get your own message. I know you will. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Come out of him. By the way, this is crazy. I had a guy tell me one time, You ever notice that when Jesus called demons out of people, he never said in Jesus' name? I said, Sir. Have you ever really legitimately read a Bible? What? <laughs> Jesus was the gospel personified before the gospel ever took place. <laughs> Didn't use the name of Jesus. He was Jesus. <laughs> Man, I'm thinking to myself, the evangelical church in America acts like they're drunker than Cooter Brown half the time. <laughs> read a Bible. It will keep you from so much foolishness. You know, the Bible will mess up a lot of what we think is good preaching. I used to go to these big camp meetings, and I'd hear people preaching. I was like, "Woo, that's preaching. Go home, read the Bible. And I was like, ooh, that's crap. <laughs> right? And so the Bible is so plain that Jesus simply said, come out. Now watch this, verse 9. And he asked him, what is thy name? By the way, don't carry on big old long lengthy conversations with demons, but here's why Jesus asked the name. The name of a demon is the function of a demon. Don't act like, oh, I got to make me a better YouTube video, so I'm going to spend six hours talking to a demon. Stop all that nonsense. That's witchcraft. That's necromancy. You hear me? Yeah, they'll talk. But the problem in the American deliverance movement is we have developed a worship for the manifestations rather than for the freedom that comes after the manifestation. And we're like, oh, Lord, we got deliverance. I hope they scream. I hope they vomit. I hope they levitate. I hope they just get some peace. Yeah. Right? That's what I hope. Yeah, they scream. Yeah, they vomit. Yeah, they levitate. Yeah, they go all Linda Blair crazy. Yep, yep. But stop worshiping the manifestation, and let's get to a place where we are happy that they're getting freedom and peace because the number one responsibility of a demon is to take people's peace, and we want them to have peace. We want them to have peace. And so it happens different for everybody. So he said, okay, what's your name? Now watch this. He answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. That's interesting. That is textbook demonism. They talk that way. You see, there's never one. They're like gang members. They're cowards. 
You got a spirit of rejection, you got abandonment. And more than likely, you got a spirit of molestation because that's where it came from. That was the open doors, you said, right? And so that they come together. And so he said, oh, my name's Legion, comma, for we are many. So he goes from this singular to plurality. Textbook demonism. Now, I'm not going to be mean, but I am going to be biblical. I find it interesting that the only people, I know we live streaming, the only people in the Bible that ever made an issue over their pronouns were demons. Y'all hear me, younger generation? Stop letting people push that mess on you. It's an agenda from the devil. Use my proper pronoun. The only people in the Bible that made issues about their pronouns were demons. That was it. I'm telling you. Some of you parents, look, your kids don't need a whooping you do. Because you have lied to your kids and you told them to play them games in their public school. Well, call so-and-so if they want to have a litter box. If they want to act like Catwoman, then, you know, just, you got to treat them like a kitty. I, I, I know Billy is a Billy, but Billy wants to be a Sally. So make sure you use the proper pronoun so you don't go to the office. Your kid's not a coward. You're a coward for teaching them that nonsense. You ought to get right with God. You ought to get right with God's what you ought to do. That is nonsense. Putting a lying spirit in your kids. I don't care if the media is here or not. I ain't bowing to none of them. We wave a bunch of flags around here, but it won't ever be some rainbow flag outside where we've compromised the truth because we are not a gay-affirming church. We're a God-affirming church up in this house. It's time the church takes a stand against this nonsense. They're coming for our children. They're coming for our children. That's just, that's as bold as I'll be, all right? I've done backed out of some of that stuff, so I'm going to be sweet. I'll be sweet when I preach in your church. I'll be like myself when I preach here, amen. Verse 10. And he, watch this, the demon, besought him much that he would not send him out of the country. Now, let me say a couple things. Although, as the late great Derek Prince said, yeah, it's not a good idea to carry on a long conversation with demons. Sometimes they want to take over the conversation. you got to shut them down. If we have the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, d d just don't let them run their mouth the whole time because they will. Because here's Jesus, and it's going to say not once but twice that demons besought him much. You know what that means? That means that demon wouldn't shut up. If the Holy Ghost says besought him much, that's not like, please, pretty please, please. No, no. He just kept on like a chainsaw. Right? Demons are like nagging mother-in-laws. Just kidding, just kidding. Good grief. I'm just, I'm just checking my crowd out here, right? <laughs> and it besought him much. It just kept on. It wouldn't stop. But then watch this. After it beseeches him much, notice what the request was that he would not send him out of the country. Now, there's a lot here. I can promise you, Pastor Henry Schaefer can and will explain things like this much better than me. He's been in it longer than I've been alive. But I'm gonna tell you something. Do you know why the demon says, hey, uh, don't send us out of the country? Because demons have been given specific assignments and purposes and they are extraordinarily territorial. That's why there are certain demons over certain denominations to keep people distracted from the truth. There are territorial familiar spirits over your house because it's got witchcraft on the inside. There are territorial spirits, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this world, the Bible says. And we better suit up and boot up and put on the whole armor of God. I believe there are demons that are over regions politically. You better know that be the case. And this demon said, don't send me away from my assignment. Don't send me away from my region. Don't kick me out of the country. So verse 11, now there was nigh under the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. I find it interesting that Jesus called it an unclean spirit. And the first thing it wanted to do was leave that body and go to an unclean vessel. Demons like nastiness. So let me just say something. I'm just, I'm just teaching through this. I'm just helping myself. 
But sometimes if we don't get practical in deliverance ministry, we don't understand just really how much of the children's bread it really is. You know, the Bible talks about an unclean spirit wanting unclean things. Did you know it's why some people, good people, godly people, people that love God and want better for themselves and their family, it's why we can watch a show like uh, Hoarders, and we're like, what? They have magazines that are 50 years old that are piled 20 feet high. They live in feces. Their kids cannot even sleep in a bed. There is garbage and trash. There's roaches and rats all over their house. And we're like, how in the world could someone live like that? It's a spirit. It's a spirit. It's why some people, they're good people. They love God, but they have no personal hygiene whatsoever. Do I need to sit down and teach a little bit? It's not because you're wicked. It's not because you're evil. It's because there's a tormenting spirit that's unclean that doesn't want you clean. Because when you clean, it feels clean and it likes to be unclean. So it don't want you clean to the house. It wants you to have a spirit of heaven and just lay around all day long. Just leave trash all over the place. Let your kids live in filth. Don't take a shower. Don't put on no deodorant. Now in here, it don't even matter. We all stinking right now, praise God. But that's a different spirit. But you think about that. Now, now, look, don't you go out of here. Don't, you can quote me, but don't misquote me. Don't go out here and call your mom and say, Mom, I've been telling you for years that the reason you ain't cleaned up that house it's full of all that garbage is because Pastor Locke told me to tell you you got a demon. Now, listen, don't you rebuke your mom and blame it on me. I'm just saying, maybe you ought to have more compassion and figure out they're not just being lazy. They're under a tormenting spirit. And why don't you go in their house with some oil and call out that spirit? <laughs> Lay hands on your mama and daddy and call that unclean Belial Beelzebub Lord of Flies up out of their house and see if they don't get a vacuum and start going to town. Demons like dirty. Does that make sense? So let's keep reading. We're about done. Well, not really. I'm just going to stop. Verse 13, and forthwith Jesus gave them leave. Now, I want you to underline that. Jesus said, okay, I'll do it. And we'll come back to that. And the unclean spirits went out, entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. And there were about 2,000. They were choked in the sea. See what earlier we talked about that spirit of death because he lived in a graveyard. As soon as that spirit of death came out of him and went to the pigs, it turned into a spirit of suicide and all them pigs killed themselves. Everything we face in deliverance ministry is like right here in this one chapter. And we've made this whole chapter about salvation for years. It has nothing to do with salvation and everything to do with deliverance. But I want you to see something that shocks me when I read this. It shocks me. Matter of fact, it, it, it emotionally supercharges me verse 13 it says and forthwith jesus gave them leave now look at me church it's hard for me as a deliverance minister to wrap my mind around that because we know that demons beg and borrow and they, they 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 try to bargain with you right and i'm blown away by the fact that jesus allowed a bargain with the demonic. It's in the text. It's right there. I just read it. King James. Jesus gave the demons leave. Thousands of them. It's like people say, well, I know I'm saved because God answered my prayer. Well, he answered the devil's prayer too and they ain't saved because the devils believe and tremble. But my question is, why would Jesus strike a compromise with demons that he could have got out in various ways. He's Jesus after all. Why would Jesus compromise with demons and basically, in essence, can I say it and be reverent, give them, it seems like, what they were looking for. It was them that asked, and Jesus allowed it. This is Gregology, not theology. So you ain't got to split your church over it. But I think you'll be hard-pressed to find a different or a better interpretation. You ever seen what one unwilling demon can do to somebody when it comes out? Just one. It can tear people, hurt people, rend people. 
destroy people, embarrass people, ridicule people. We could go on and on. Just one of them. Can you imagine if thousands of demons unwillingly came out of one man's body at the same time? I'm convinced. Believe what you will. That Jesus was not having compassion on a bunch of demons. Jesus knew there is no way this man will humanly be able to withstand the pressure, the release, and the torment of not one, but thousands of demons coming out at one time. There's no way one man could stay standing. And it's amazing how the human body is built that people can have so many demons and still stand. And Jesus says to the demons, I will allow you to get your request, not for your sake, but for his. And listen to me when I tell you, church, listen to me. Deliverance ministry is not about demons. It's about loving the demonized. And we will look crazy when we love them. We will be called heretics when we love them. But Jesus knew that there is no way that that man would ever survive that many demons unwillingly coming out. And he said, I'll make a compromise with you, not for your sake, but for his sake. And deliverance ministry is a ministry of love, church. It's a ministry of love. It's a ministry of compassion. It's not a ministry of embarrassing people and making ourselves look better. It's loving people. And by the way, do you know there's a verse that goes with that? Perfect love cast out fear. There's times you can just hug a demon right out of somebody in the name of Jesus and through the love of the Father. That's the facts. So yeah, fantastical things happen, but I'm not in this for the fantastical. I'm in this for the freedom in other people's lives. And Jesus allowed it to happen because it was a ministry of love. And they fed the swine, told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. They come to Jesus. This is where we always preach, and I'm just going to read it. This is where we always preach on salvation. But notice what they saw. They come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil. Had the legion. Sitting. That cat wasn't doing that. Not before Jesus showed up. Always night and day. No peace. No joy. Nothing. No assurance. No victory. Run, 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 run. You get Jesus, you will sit in peace. You will know if you need a level of deliverance by the lack of peace that you operate in. People that have the ability to be anxious, free, and live at peace, they don't need deliverance. They just need some discipline so they can keep their peace. And so the Bible is very plain. They said, who is this guy? He's sitting down. He's clothed. I mean, even Luke tells us the guy's buck naked, so I don't know where he got his clothes. I'm assuming that Jesus, you know, knew what was about to transpire everywhere he went. And so the disciples carried around like an Adidas bag full of clothes for naked people that got demons cast out of them but he immediately got clothed right he immediately put his clothes on and then it says this and in his right mind and they were afraid you know what the clothes didn't make them afraid the sitting didn't make them afraid the fact that he was now in his right mind is what freaked him out and I'm gonna tell you what's wrong with the church world a lot although I love the church but listen to me it's a shame when there's more preachers in this nation that want people in their wrong mind than they want to tell them the truth and get them in their right mind. We don't mind you in your wrong mind if you're tithing. We don't mind you in your wrong mind if you're bringing people to church and filling up small groups. But real ministers of the gospel want you in your right mind. 
And to get you in your right mind, we got to preach the right message. And the right message is the full gospel. And there's never been a time that Jesus ever told us to preach the gospel with which he did not give us the power, anointing, and authority to drive out evil spirits through the power of his name. That's the full gospel. So they're afraid. They're upset. You know the story. They told him to leave. Get out. One miracle, by the way. One. Get out. And by the way, Jesus didn't get mad, didn't fuss, didn't cuss, didn't do a video to defend himself. You know what he did? He left. You know why? Because Jesus never stays where Jesus is not wanted. And America better figure that out. Because Europe didn't figure that out years ago. They were the epicenter of revival, but they took God for granted. And I'm telling you right now, it's dry as cracker juice over there. And when you don't want God, he'll get in a boat and go somewhere else to people that do want him. And so these people were just mad. They'd lost their money. Verse 17, they began to pray him out of their coast. Verse 18, when he was come to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. He's like, hey, man, I want to be one of these guys. I want to follow you. I want to let people know what you did for me. And Jesus is like, nope, can't go. Why? Huh. Verse 19, how be it? Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, go home to thy friends. See, he wasn't always in isolation. A demon got in there. A demon took him away from the people that he loved the most. And Jesus said, now that you're clean, I want you to go tell your friends. And watch this. Tell them how great things, shout great things. Great. Shout it again. Great. How great things. Now the question is, what are the great things? The great thing he's talking about is the miracle of deliverance in the context. Show them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had, watch this, compassion on thee. This happened another time in Mark chapter 9. We won't develop that for sure. But there's two times, this being one of them in your Bible, that Jesus, from his own mouth, defined deliverance ministry as compassion. Compassion. And I think if we're not careful... We can get so addicted to the fantastical nature of demons coming out that the church will be more aware of evil spirits than we are the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. And without the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the rest of it doesn't make any difference at all at all so this is not a conference about teaching you how to scream louder at demons and sometimes they pretend to be hard of hearing and play possum you got to get a little loud this this conference is not about methodology it's about a message the message has come out in Jesus name that, that that's the message now that doesn't mean, because everybody's methodology is different, that doesn't mean that your methodology is not important. Your methodology can be witchcraft. Hear me? Your methodology can be right and your methodology could be wrong. The problem is we have boiled the, the declaration and definition of deliverance ministry down to a methodology and we've diluted the message. So we think it's about him, it's about him, it's about her, it's about her, it's about them. No, it's about him. That's it. That's where the authority comes from. That's where the power comes from. That's where the anointing comes from. And Jesus said, go back and tell these people that you were delivered from demons and I had compassion. And he departed and began to set the world ablaze. The Bible said he went back to Decapolis. You know what Decapolis means? Deca means 10. Apolis means metropolis. It was 10 cities combined into one city. He ran from Mount Juliet to Nashville and said, extra, extra, read all about it. Look what Jesus did for me. He will do the same for you. That's deliverance ministry. It's having compassion on people. It's loving people. It's the ability to discern the difference between them and it. Good people, bad spirits. One night, and I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm just going to quit. I ain't done, but get, let me have a keys up here. One night I was in uh, Indiana. 
I go so many places, it all runs together. But I was in Indiana about two or three months after this original conference that we had last year. And I went to Indiana and I was preaching one night and we had some of our staff guys there. And, and it, you know, deliverance like breaks out on the road everywhere we go now. It's like Waffle House. Go, ah, you walk in there and demons start getting mad. And so we just, I, I don't go places. I, I, I don't want to be known like, oh yeah, he's coming to bring deliverance. I just, I just show up and preach and it just, it just happens, right? And so I was in this tent and I mean, the, the place was just packed. It wasn't a tent this big, but it's, it's probably as big as this side over here. And it was just full. They had an overflow tent and it was full and, and, and people were just everywhere. It was a stomped ant bed. We were praying over people and deliverance broke out. And I mean, it was just, it was just beautiful. And I, I wasn't even expecting it. Deliverance really broke out b before I even, if I can use the term, wanted it to, right? I was still kind of preaching. It just happened. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> here's the message now. And so we just went with it. And this man, you know, I used to apologize for crying all the time when I preach. I quit doing that because God told me one time, if I ever drop your tears, I'll drop your ministry. So I don't mind when I cry. So I'm up here on a, on a platform and we'd move the pulpit out of the way and had a handheld mic, you know, and I'm trying to lay hands on people and trying to touch folks. And this guy stammered and stumbled. He was drunk as could be. Right up the middle aisle or side aisle. Came right up to the middle in the front. And he reached around his back and pulled out a half drunk bottle of Jim Bean, Jack Daniels, some of that mess. And he took it and he just like had a lid on it, but he threw it up on the platform. Clunk, 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 clunk. Everybody's like, you can't do that in religious churches. You can't do it in religious churches. And so he just clunked down, clunked down, clunked down. And I mean, he was just, he had a big old thick beard, looking like old Duck Dynasty and stuff. And I mean, he's just crying, just snotting, weeping, just but you could tell he was still inebriated, as it were. And so I, I laid my hands on him. And I, you have to understand something about me. I preached against all of y'all. I didn't like none of you for 30 years. I didn't believe in any of this. I'm the least likely guy to have anything to do with deliverance. Much less do a movie about it. I didn't believe in tongues. I pretended like I believed in miracles because that was the thing to do, but I didn't. I had a best-selling best -selling shirt for years that said, Demons still flee at the name of Jesus. If one of them would have got up and fleed, I'd have freaked out. You see, all that stuff is just talk in the American church. So this stuff's new to me. So when God, like, gives me a word for people, and he started to do a lot more, and it, it, it still unnerves me a little bit but I always know when I'm right prophetically because I start crying over people I can't help it some people sing over folks I cry over people so the Lord said I want you to start talking to him about his daddy so I looked at him I said sir look me in my eyes right now and I started talking to him about his daddy in spirit of rejection he just started just trembling and it wasn't because he was drunk anymore he just started trembling just started shaking just started weeping and so, you know, all the people were manifesting and things were happening. And the Lord said, I want you to stay with this man. Stay with this man. Stay with this man. And it was like there was this moment when the Holy Spirit just like, like sobered him up. I mean, like immediately. Like the glossiness in his eyes. Like, I mean, it, it was almost like his breath changed. I mean, it just everything about it. Just, he, just, he just stood up, right? Began to wipe his nose and his eyes. And he's, he's just sweating and crying profusely. But it's like God just sobered him up like a little kid. And I said, sir, and I began to prophesy over him the word of knowledge about his father. And I mean, the more I said about his daddy, the bigger his eyes got like two Jimmy Dean sausage patties. He couldn't believe it, right? And I, I knew I was right. I started crying. He started crying. And that verse I quoted a few minutes ago, perfect love casts out fear. It came to me. I said something on the internet like the next day about it and all my ex-buddies, you know, they all inviscerated me and said that's the most nonsensical comic book stuff they ever heard, but I ain't worried about what they think. So that verse popped into my mind. And so I, at this point, I'd put the mic down. I had both hands on the sides of his face. And I'm crying, he's crying, and the Lord's working. And the Lord said, I want you to hug him. Don't ask no demon's name. Don't scream, don't get back on the mic. Don't push him in the stomach. Just give this drunk man the biggest hug you've ever given anybody. 
So I stepped off the platform, got about right where he was, and he just fell into my arms. I mean, just fell into my chest, began to weep. And I'm telling you, Holy, listen, I don't play with miracles and signs and wonders. Holy Ghost, kill me right now for everybody as an example of Ananias and Sapphira if I'm lying. I don't stretch the truth. I don't make up illustrations. I got plenty to preach on. I ain't got to write books about fake stuff. I leaned over and I hugged that man. And I'm telling you, as soon as my hands got all the way around that man, I just pulled him in real close. And I just said something to the effect. I called his name and I said, Sir... God deeply loves you. When I said that, that spirit of rejection that I didn't even have to talk to, I mean it manifested itself. And God said, keep holding him. Keep holding him. He went down to the ground. Keep holding him. Keep holding him. And I'm hugging this half-drunk man on the platform. That spirit of rejection. Ah! coming out God said you hug that demon out of that man you hug that abandonment out of that man you hug that drunkenness out of that man you hug that generational curse out of and I hugged him and I said God loves you the devil couldn't handle that and all I'm saying today as the pastor of this church is that if you don't learn one thing about deliverance ministry, you know this. The deliverance ministry is about the love of the Father to His people. That's deliverance ministry. That's deliverance ministry. And may God, may God baptize us in His love. Some of you right now need to spin around in your chair and use it as your altar and say, God, I want to walk in a spirit of humility. I want to be meek like Jesus, lowly like Jesus. Baptize me in the love of the Father, Lord. Some of you need to start getting down here to the altar. Some of you are already here. Some of you need to spin around, use it as an altar. Some of you need to walk around outside the tent and get right with God. But some of you right now just need to get on your feet and start coming and say, God, right now, baptize me in the love of the Father. Make me a lover of people. Make me a lover of souls. God, make me want to love people more. That's the whole responsibility in calling out demons in the name of Jesus. Oh, how the love of the Father. How the love of the Father needs to just be immersed all around us. Come on, come on, come on, come on. We could preach on this chapter for six weeks. There's so much in here about deliverance ministry. But God gave you what you needed. If you come to this conference and get all the training and buy all of our books and watch all of our videos and go to the movie and don't ever learn to love people right where they're at, you've missed the whole thing. Deliverance is compassion. Deliverance is loving the broken. Deliverance is loving the diseased, the sick, the handicapped, the demonized. The oppressed, the possessed, the afflicted, the addicted. That's deliverance ministry. Just come for a few moments. Saturate yourself with the love of the Father. we thank you Lord we thank you for your love that even when the multitudes would gather around you the Bible says that you were moved with compassion 
for the people. And Lord, we thank you that you're the God that sees. We thank you that you're the God that knows. Lord, we thank you that before you formed us in the womb of our mother, that you knew us, that you called us by name, that you set us apart, Lord. Lord, that there was an ordination of the prophets to the nations. Lord, we thank you for every good and perfect gift that comes from above the Father of love. Oh, the agape Father, the agape a love of the Father wash over you in Jesus mighty name in Jesus mighty name with the keys to the kingdom open every room of the temple in Jesus mighty name let the agape love of the Father fill every room of your temple in Jesus mighty name be filled with the love of the Father the love that was poured out you in the wee hours of the morning when you're crying out and you're saying 
Smurf shirts up here, up here. Sometimes we just call audibles and just throw a flag on the field and tell them to come up. Amen. I need you to see these people because this is how we're going to end today because this is going to be important for something that happens later today. All right. So just get them up here. Climb on up here. Woo. Feel like I've been to church. I'm liking it. Hallelujah. We'll be out in this parking lot in a moment for baptisms. Those of you that need to get baptized. There's all the, look, we got some little changing rooms back there. But we're going to have some built, but there just wasn't enough room with the crowds, right? So I'll just keep coming up and give you a minute to get here. For most of you, it's not going to be feasible to you to try to get anywhere. There's plenty of food on campus. So you, you got to be back if you're coming back to, to meet Pagani or do one of the book signings. you got to be here at 3 o'clock anyhow. We're not used to getting out on Sunday. It's 12.50, right? We're used to getting out at like 2 o'clock <laughs> and uh, when, when everybody's already, you know, past all of the restaurants. And so you pretty much have to be back at 3 anyhow. If not, you got to be back at 5 o'clock. And so some of you be saving seats. And I know some of you going to try to get a nap, go sleep in your car, do something, right? And uh, I know at night time the police department has decided to close down the road that has nothing to do with us please do not be upset about that we didn't do that it made the neighbors mad but the reason they decided to do that is because our parking has been so flawless they had to have something to argue about right and so they they created uh some drama so it's probably not even feasible to leave and then look i can tell you right now this room is poised for what is about to happen tonight there's going to be so much freedom in this house tonight it's going to be beautiful it's going to be beautiful so Here's how I want to end this particular part. We don't ever dismiss. We just say see in a little bit. And so, again, 3 o'clock, two tables will be up here. Me and Alexander Pagani, Apostle Pagani, will be up here with our books and uh, meeting people. And, of course, other people are around. There's plenty of food trucks, a lot of stuff. Might as well stick around, make some new friends. Then at 5 o'clock we start. Then 7 o'clock we go into mass deliverance. You say, why do you have all of these people up here with blue shirts on? Because during the time that we're doing that meet and greet at another spot that Austin, Austin's going to tell you about. We're going to tell you about a meeting that uh, that we think some of you will want to be involved in. So, Brother Austin, come up here and explain to us who all these beautiful blue people are. Amen. These are some of my heroes right here. Yeah. These are our Global Vision Hub leaders who represent the Lord first and then Global Vision Church across the country. These are folks right here who invite people in their home every week to watch our services. We see hundreds of of deliverances, baptisms, salvations across the country. Every single Sunday we see lives changed and impacted because these are a few of our hub leaders who are willing to pay the price and just embrace what the Lord is doing in this place. So if you would be interested in perhaps becoming a Global Vision hub leader and making a difference in what you're experiencing under this tent, take this back to your community. You'd be trained by pastor, our staff, our team on how to do so. There is a process and I'm going to explain that process this afternoon at four o'clock we were originally going to be here under the tent do we need to go to the over okay we'll be over here on this side of the tent at four o'clock this afternoon and I'm going to get a microphone and just explain what that means you say I'm involved in another church that's okay and I'm going to explain how that doesn't interfere with being a Global Vision Hub leader. This afternoon at 4 o'clock, join me. We're going to have a great time in the Lord and join this great group of people who are making a difference all across America yes. through our hub group. So thank you. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Amen. So I hope many of you will be involved in that interest meeting. Again, it'll be right over here, and he'll let you know. It's one thing to, to come to a hub, and we have a, uh, a map. It's kind of like a, you know Isaiah's deliverance map, things like that. But it has little orange dots. It lets you know where a hub, where a satellite global vision is close to where you live but this is more on those of you that would like to be leaders open up your restaurant your place of business many do another church building or your house uh, for a time of worship with the global vision family and uh, and we cover you and support you and all of that so again at four o'clock so three o'clock we'll start the meet and greet in here four o'clock that meeting will be back there at five o'clock apostle Bagani will start baptisms will be right out there so even uh, the folks out there in the overflow if those people are going to be following in baptismal celebrations right outside the tent and uh, We'll meet you out there. We love you guys. We'll see you this afternoon. See you okay. throughout the afternoon and see you this evening. Hey, hub leaders, take a look at the camera. We're going to get a picture right here and wave to the online audience. We love you guys. Thank you. God bless you. Y'all have a great afternoon. See you soon.